Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining today's update on COVID-19. As of today, we have had 802,065 lab confirmed cases, 2,786 new cases reported since yesterday, 2,374 people in the hospital, and sadly, 10,046 people who've died. We've passed the grim milestone of 10,000 deaths in North Carolina, and it's a stark reminder of how dangerous this virus can be. Our prayers are with those who've lost loved ones to this cruel disease. Our numbers, though, remain stable, which is good, and we're encouraged to see a continued decline in our hospitalizations and percentage of positive COVID-19 tests. Still, we must keep our guard up. This virus and its variants are still spreading too easily. Doing the simple things that we know work, like wearing a mask and social distancing, will slow the spread and save lives until vaccines are more widely available. Distributing vaccine quickly and equitably remains our top priority in North Carolina. We continue running an efficient vaccine distribution and are getting all of North Carolina's allocated first doses into arms each week before we receive the next shipment. And I'm grateful for the work of our Department of Health and Human Services and the vaccine providers across this state who are delivering this life-saving vaccine as quickly as possible. Speed is critical, but we're also emphasizing equity. Communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by this devastating pandemic, and the state is working to reduce the high rates of sickness that this population is experiencing. The health care coverage gap in North Carolina has left many without access to a doctor. Add to that long-standing systemic inequities in our health care system, and you, get, and you can get mistrust of this vaccine as well as lack of preventive care. We're working to address those inequities. We can start by making sure that every community has access to these vaccines. And that means making a conscious effort to track the data and seek fairness in vaccine distribution. When North Carolina received its first allocations of doses, we sent them to every single county in the state. And our team has ramped up efforts to include vaccine providers that serve communities of color. They're reaching out to underserved communities and paying attention to equity and how they allocate doses, including weekly vaccine events. And it's important to let the public know exactly what we're doing. North Carolina has been recognized nationally for our work sharing data about race and ethnicity with vaccinations and confirmed COVID-19 cases down to the county level and the department will continue to make this information widely available. Dr. Mandy Cohen, our Secretary of Health and Human Services, has led this effort, and she'll talk more about those in a few minutes, those steps that we're taking in a few minutes. North Carolina is making some progress in improving, improving vaccine access for black North Carolinians, although we have more to do. Last week, 18% of vaccines were administered to African Americans, up from 11% four weeks earlier. That's a 65% increase. This is an improvement, but there is more work to be done when North Carolina's population is 22% black. Also, in our Latinx community, vaccination rates have been especially low. Today, I'm issuing Executive Order 193, which will extend previous orders giving the Department of Health and Human Service Secretary the ability to temporarily waive industry regulations in order to speed vaccine distribution. Today's order gives the department the authority to expand the types of providers to administer the vaccines. As the state continues to fight the pandemic and protect North Carolinians, I am ordering today state officials to marshal all of the state resources, including property, facilities, and personnel upon request by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services to help with vaccination efforts as our supply continues to increase coming in. We know that there's still not enough vaccine supply to vaccinate the millions of people who need it, not by a long shot. We're pushing for more 
And today on a call with the Biden administration's coronavirus team, we were told North Carolina would get another 5% increase in vaccine supply this week. That's good. Now, I know all of this is hard, and I want people to know that I am committed to making sure that vaccine gets to every North Carolinian as quickly and as fairly as possible. And in the meantime, please, we have to keep wearing our mask and doing the things we know work to slow the spread of the virus. If we keep doing what works, I know we'll get through this. At this time, I'll invite uh, Dr. Mandy Cohen to share an update on our vaccine rollout and particularly as it relates to equity. Dr. Cohen. Thank you, Governor. While our numbers continue to trend downward, we still see very high levels of virus across North Carolina. Our most powerful tools to help protect ourselves and our loved ones are to practice those three W's and get vaccinated when it's your turn. As of today, more than 1.4 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been given in our state. North Carolina vaccine providers have done a phenomenal job of getting vaccines to people using all first doses each week before the next shipment comes. You can see this on our dashboard, which we are now updating daily Monday to Friday. You can also see on our dashboard that we have work to do when it comes to equity. We are committed to doing better and are already seeing some improvements as the governor shared. This past week, 18% of vaccines administered in the state have gone to our black or African-American population up from 11% the week of January 13th. We have more work to do, as mentioned, in our Latinx Hispanic community where rates remain far too low. Our work starts with transparency and accountability. And I'm proud to share that we were one of the first states to provide race and ethnicity data for vaccines administered and are now providing that data at the county level. We are already acting on this data by embedding equity into our vaccine allocation process. First, we're making sure that vaccines are available in all 100 counties each and every week. Second, we are giving additional vaccines to counties with higher numbers of low-income adults over the age of 65 or higher numbers of historically marginalized populations 65 and older. Third, we're giving vaccines to providers who reach rural and marginalized communities, such as community health clinics. And finally, we're setting aside a portion of our weekly vaccine allocation for events that focus on underserved communities. We also have expectations of our vaccinating providers. We expect that the percentage of vaccine administered to historically marginalized populations in that county meet or exceed that county's population estimates. We're also asking vaccine providers along with the public and private sectors to work together in new ways. We have formed a dedicated team to provide technical assistance to vaccine providers and to help facilitate partnerships so that everyone can achieve both speed and equity. Let me share a few examples of what this looks like in practice. Vident has a collaborative effort with East Carolina University, Pitt County, community organizations and faith-based organizations at the Greenville Convention Center that is off to a great start vaccinating about 1,500 people a day with 30% of those who are receiving vaccine being African-American. Wake Med and the Wake County Public Health Department partnered with churches and community centers to reach underserved communities in one particular zip code. With about 150 volunteers, they vaccinated almost 1,800 people, of whom 91% identified as Black or African American. And in Charlotte, Novant Health partnered with the Park Church, one of the largest African-American churches in Charlotte, to host a large vaccination event. Atrium's mobile unit has provided vaccines to more than 1,800 community members, of whom 61% were Black African-American and 10% were Latinx Hispanic. This week, these mobile units are reaching rural communities in Stanley, Anson, and Cleveland counties. Lincoln Community Health Center, Dale Fell Health Center, Agape Health Services, and many other community health centers have been using more than 60% of their vaccines for black African-American populations. 
These success stories show there are many different ways to ensure equitable access to vaccines if everyone is focused on the goal and is held accountable to it. We know that some people still have questions about the vaccine itself. We are equally committed to engaging communities as partners and working with trusted voices to share accurate information as well as their personal experiences. And I'm so pleased that Commissioner Evans is here with us today to provide his perspective. The most significant challenge we face is that there's just not enough vaccine available. Supplies remain low, which means that many people have to wait, and I know that that is frustrating. With new vaccines on the horizon and projections of increasing supplies, we will be able to vaccinate more people in the coming months. Everyone will have a spot to take their shot. Thank you, Governor. Thanks for your leadership, Dr. Cohen. I'll now recognize the Honorable Charles Evans, who is the president of the North Carolina Association of Black County Officials and the chairman of the Cumberland County Board of Commissioners. Chairman Evans. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. I am Charles Evans, president of the North Carolina Association of Black County Officials and chairman of the Cumberland County Board of Commissioners. It has been almost a year since our lives changed because of a virus. COVID-19 sent us home from our workplace and our schools. We are in a battle, and our protective armor against this virus has included face masks, keeping our distances from people, and washing our hands. This battle is raging on. We have lost more than 10,000 people across North Carolina to this virus, and my heartfelt sympathies go out to their families. Our health departments, hospital systems, and other providers across the state are working hard to vaccinate as many of our citizens as possible. I am here today to encourage everyone, especially others who are black or brown, to get a vaccine when your time comes. Supplies are very limited now, so there may be a wait, but everyone will be able to get their shot as supplies increase. It is free to everyone. Blacks make up 21% of our population in North Carolina, but only 13% of the vaccines given have gone into black arms. 10% of our population is Hispanic in North Carolina but only 2% of the vaccines given have gone into brown arms. Some black and brown citizens may mistrust the vaccine, and I understand why based on longstanding and continuing racial and ethnic injustices in our healthcare system. I trust the vaccines because they have been tested. They are safe and effective. If we are going to gain control of our lives, we need to get vaccinated. I want to encourage everyone to get the vaccine for yourself, for your family, and for others who live and work around you. I certainly understand the concerns with getting a vaccine, but when it's my turn to get it, I will. I am ready to take a shot. To, I understand the fear, the doubts, the concerns that people of color have. My suggestion to you would be to pray about this decision. Talk to your doctor, your family, and the friends you trust. I hope you will come to the same conclusion I did, that these vaccines save lives. Remember, change starts with each of us. Change starts with rolling up our sleeves, sticking out our arms, and taking our shot. The impact will be felt by our entire community and beyond. God bless. Thank you, Governor Cooper. Thank you, Chairman Evans. Inspiring. We appreciate your words. Also with me today is Commissioner of Prisons Todd Ishi and Director of Emergency Management Mike Sprayberry. Monica McGee and Brian Tipton are our sign language interpreters, and behind the scenes, Jackie and Jasmine Mativier 
are our Spanish language interpreters. We'll be glad to take questions from the media, and if you can identify yourself and your organization, we will take the first question. Our first question is from Dawn Vaughn with the News and Observer. Hi, Dawn Vaughn with the News and Observer. Uh, today, the Retail Merchants Association told um, House Health Committee that members need more information about when the state plans to um, start the frontline worker vaccinations. And I know it's limited, but as you said, the Biden administration said there's a um, little higher percentage of vaccines coming. So is there information you can give to those frontline workers that are able to get the vaccine? And then also, I wanted to know the fencing around the Capitol grounds is still up, and it's been several months since the protest. So when will that be reopened to the public? Thanks, uh, Don. As to your first question, one thing we know is that 83% of the deaths from COVID-19 in North Carolina have come from people 65 and over. And right now, the state is vaccinating people 65 and over along with healthcare workers. It's important to get those shots in arms and that there are thousands and thousands of people that are on waiting lists across the state who are 65 and over. We're working on getting more supply and uh, making sure that people 65 and over get vaccinated. We also care deeply about our essential frontline workers. And this team is working on some precise dates that we will be able to give the providers as to when we can move to essential first line, uh, frontline workers. And this week, we will be giving you that information after the team has talked to providers and worked through it. And we'll be trying to get that information out as soon as possible. Um, I'm not quite sure about the fence around the Capitol grounds. We certainly want uh, our government complex open to the public. I know a lot of the museums, the legislature's in session. We want people down, downtown in uh, taking part in our government processes. Uh, obviously, with the uh, insurrection and attack on the Capitol, uh, the level of threat has been raised, and uh, I know law enforcement is concerned, but I'll certainly look into that and see if there is a timeline on that particular issue. Uh, next question, please. We have a follow-up. Don Vaughn, News and Observer. Hi, thanks for the follow. On the um, percent set aside to be more equitable for distribution, so that is that happening in, happening immediately, and that'll be for the same, the 65 and older group. Are there specific counties? Uh, first, we're telling our providers that we expect them to distribute vaccines based on percentage people in the population, uh, making sure that they are uh, concentrating on underserved communities. Uh, the numbers are getting better, but as you can see from the numbers we talked about earlier, we have a ways to go. But I'll let uh, Dr. Cohen talk about specifics on that. Hi, Don. So the allocation methodology I mentioned in my opening remarks is something we've actually been doing for the last two weeks um, and intend to do as we continue forward in this process. So over the last two weeks, we have allocated vaccine based on county population and then given increases to those to those counties that see a higher uh, population of those who are over the age of 65 and low income and over the age of 65 and from our historically marginalized communities. Um, so that has already been happening. In addition, we make sure to target any um, set aside uh, allocation related to um, particular special vaccine events. And we want those events to really target our underserved communities. I mentioned a couple of the examples already. Um, and so we've been supporting that over the last uh, two weeks and will that will continue um, in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Ashley Talley with WRAL. Hi, Governor and Dr. Cohen. Um, I wondered, first of all, Governor, if you could expand a little on, you were saying that your executive order opens up who can administer vaccines, and if that means um, primary physicians or pharmacies might be opening to that. And to that end, I also had a question about um, Walgreens 
who is doing vaccines at 300 sites across the state. Do we know where those are and are those doses coming from the state allocation or another national allocation? I'll let Dr. Cohen expound on this, but uh, the executive order gives the secretary, Dr. Cohen, the authority to expand the different types of people who can give vaccinations and that is to get ready for when our supply increases. We're very much hoping that our supplies will start coming in, particularly if Johnson & Johnson, uh, the, that authorization goes through, we'll have more vaccines, so we want to have more people to get it. Uh, Walgreens is a separate program by the federal government. They have a number of their stores. I think they're getting 100 doses each that comes in a separate allocation from the feds. Uh, but I'll let Dr. Cohen uh, address that. Uh, the second part of your question, she's going to get that too. Thanks. Hi, Ashley. First on the executive order, just to reiterate uh, the governor's point, we are not short on vaccine providers. We are short on vaccines. Um, and so that is our limitation at this point. But we do want to get ready and onboard providers so when our supply does increase that we make sure that we can continue both the speed and the equity that we're working under. Um, as far as the Walgreen pharmacies, they are going to have vaccines starting at the end of this week at 300 or so stores. And as the governor mentioned, they're going to have a very small allocation in each store. Um, those 300 were selected by the uh, by Walgreens um, themselves. Uh, they are already taking appointments uh, for their uh, vaccines that they will have at the end of the week. We already heard that their website uh, was, was having um, some issues. So we know there's a lot of demand out there. And again, supply is incredibly low at each of these um, individual sites. It's about 100 doses at each of these 300 sites. Uh, and again, this allocation comes in addition to what we are getting as a state. So the, farm, the Walgreens gets that allocation directly from the federal government. It does not come through our state allocation, which is different than the long-term care program, which also runs through Walgreens and CVS. That did come from our state allocation. Um, so slightly different um, mechanisms that they're employing here. But again, Walgreens, as they move forward starting this weekend, will come from a separate allocation from the federal government, very small amount of doses in each of their about 300 stores across North Carolina. Thank you. Next question, please. We have a follow-up, Ashley Talley, WRAL. That's really helpful information about Walgreens. Thank you. One more quick question. Wake County is planning its first mass vaccination um, for this coming weekend and has requested 10,000 um, doses. Do you think the state will be able to allocate those and will that come from that special um, portion that you're saving specifically for mass vaccinations, meaning the rest of Wake County wouldn't have fewer? That about Wake County, I'll have to go back and look at the specifics, but 10,000 is a very big number given the very limited pool of uh, supply of vaccine that I keep talking about here. We do want to make sure that we are supporting vaccine events across uh, the state. Um, and so I will go back and look at Wake County in particular. We do acknowledge that Wake County has gotten um, a, a lower amount of vaccine in the last number of weeks. So we are trying to make that adjustment as we go forward um, for Wake County and appreciate all the efforts that have been done, whether it was in Wake County or across the state, to really make sure that we are getting vaccine out quickly and equitably. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Sydney Bouchel with WWAY. Hi, Governor. This is Sydney Bouchelle with WWAY in Brunswick County. I have uh, two questions for you. Um, first, can you tell me about how many doses the state is receiving at this time? And I know, um, second question, I know you've addressed um, equity in this conference, but can you also explain how you're allocating to each county based on need and eligibility? Here in Brunswick County, one third of the population is 65 and up. And they've administered around the same amount of vaccine as Johnston County, which is much larger than Brunswick, but only 13% of their population is 65 and up. 
Thanks for those questions. As you can see by all of the people who need this vaccine, this is a difficult uh, task in trying to determine uh, how to distribute something that millions of people want but is in very limited supply. I'm going to let Dr. Cohen address the specifics of your question. Hi there. So we get about 150,000 vaccines week over week, though we just did hear from the Biden administration this morning, as the governor mentioned, that we should see about a 5% increase. We haven't seen exactly what that translates into. We're all wondering, is that 5% of the 120 we were getting or 5% of the 150 we have been getting the last couple of weeks? So uh, stay tuned on the exact number. But it's about 150,000 doses. The vast, mass majority of those, about 120,000, are strictly distributed based on the population that the county is serving. Um, we do give a bump up for those that are serving more folks who are 65 and up and low income, 65 and up from our historically marginalized communities. As far as Brunswick, I know our team uh, just yesterday, the maybe it was the day before the days are running together, but uh, had a call with all of our vaccinating providers and other representatives from Brunswick County to make sure that we were um, understanding the situation on the ground, that we were making the adjustments and really do appreciate everyone's um, feedback as we go. As the governor continu continues to mention that the supply is incredibly low and we wish we could give more supply to everyone. We know our vaccine providers can, can deliver maybe three times the number of vaccines that we are, are getting right now. So we know that it is frustrating that the supply is low and folks could be doing more. Um, we're hopeful to see more and more vaccine uh, from, from these original two vaccines that have been approved. And we know that a third is going to be reviewed by the FDA by the end of the month. So we hope for more vaccine supplies we head into March. Thank you. Next question, please. Our next question is from Tina Terry with WSOC. Hey there, this is Tina Terry with WSOC TV in Charlotte. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, Governor, you touched on this a few moments ago, but I'll just ask for a little bit more clarification. Um, specifically, a lot of concerned teachers are out there in North Carolina. Can you give us any update on when we will get into group three, those frontline workers? And are there any plans or talks right now of perhaps moving those teachers up into a different group, allowing them to get vaccinated earlier? Thanks, Thanks for that question. And if you've watched very many of these press conferences, you know what I say is that the number one priority is getting our children safely back into the classroom. We know all that they are missing uh, by not being in classroom in person. And it's important that teachers are back there safely. With the new research that has come about, uh, we know that when you take the appropriate safety protocols, that teachers can, can be in the classroom with students and that they can teach. Uh, we also need to do more for our teachers. Uh, the legislature right now is contemplating uh, educator bonuses, which I think would be a great idea if they could do that because we know that's important. This week, we've, we're going to come forward with specific dates on when essential workers uh, will be able to start getting vaccines. Uh, we know that people have been concerned about that want to reiterate what I said earlier. We still have thousands and thousands of people who are on waiting lists who are 65 and older waiting for a vaccine and we're waiting for the supply to increase but they are still on waiting lists and we know that 83 percent of the deaths come from people 65 and over so it's important to make sure we work these vaccines and get that get that to them as quickly as we can but we also know that our essential frontline workers are important and so we're going to look at what we have before us and you'll hear something from us this week on specific dates for essential frontline workers next question please we have a follow-up tina terry wsoc thank you so much my second question i know you said that we will receive a five percent increase in vaccine this week from the federal government. 
What have we heard from the federal government about a timeline for getting more vaccine to North Carolina? Thank you for that. And anytime we get a chance to talk to the administration, we're saying we need more vaccine. I uh, was on the phone today with the Biden administration and other governors across the country, and the administration promised us they would use everything in their power to increase the supply of vaccinations. Uh, they've been talking to Pfizer and Moderna, and there have been some promises of increase. And what they have been doing is uh, distributing the vaccines to the states based on population. We also know that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has been submitted and that it may be authorized in the coming weeks so that we know that that would potentially increase the supply. One good thing about uh, the Biden administration since it took over is that it has been giving the states a three-week window of what kind of supply that we can expect to get into our state. That gives us a lot more time to plan. You know, for a while there, we were dealing with 24, 48 hour notice about what we were gonna get. And then we had to decide where all of it went in the state. And having this three weeks of prediction uh, has been good. And what they've been able to do is add a little bit more each week. So that's been a very positive thing. So we're doing everything we can to encourage the federal government to increase the supply of vaccines to North Carolina. And we're gonna continue that effort because the good thing is we have a good vaccination distribution system set up. As Dr. Cohen says, we could handle many, many more vaccines. The, the structure is set up and we want to, we want to be having that problem. Uh, but right now we're still waiting for the supply to continue to increase. Thanks. Next question, please. Our next question is from Michael Perchick with WTVB. Good afternoon, Governor. This is Michael Perchick with WTVD. Um, in reference to your last answer, when it comes to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, what steps has the state taken from a uh, logistics uh, point of view uh, when it comes to setting up vaccination sites specific to that vaccine? Um, and will there be any differences between how you treat the single-dose Johnson & Johnson version versus the multi-dose Pfizer and Moderna version? That's a great question. And we know that the ease of administering Johnson & Johnson will be much greater because it's only one dose and because you don't have the storage requirements that you have, particularly for the Pfizer, uh, Pfizer vaccine. So we know that it will be easier to administer. We had that discussion today among the governors and the Biden administration. Uh, they asked us, because we, we were asking those very same questions that you're asking me, uh, tell us how we can use this vaccine and where we should target. They want to wait to see what the FDA ultimately says about it. Uh, we're going to be talking about it in the coming weeks. We want it. Uh, we hope that it get au gets authorized if it's safe, and then we'll figure that question out. Would you want to add anything to that, Dr. Cohen? The only thing I would add is, again, it's, it's, we are planning for increased capacity as we move forward into the future. It's why we want to have more vaccinating providers waiting in the wings, if you will. And I know our vaccine providers have more capacity than they currently have right now. So that is all good news. So we are building that capacity as we wait for additional supply, whether it's more Moderna or Pfizer or, or a new third or even fourth vaccine that gets um, administered. And so, um, but what is hard for us, similar to at the early part of, of rolling out the first two vaccines, when we don't know how much is coming to us, it's really hard to plan. And I think that's why uh, Governor Cooper, as well as a number of other governors, has asked the Biden administration to give us more of a window into what does the, those allocations look like if there was to be a, a third vaccine so that we can start to plan in more concrete terms. Again, we're getting that capacity waiting in the wings, but we really it's hard for us to know how and where to execute on it until we really know some at least ballpark numbers of what's coming to us. So I hope to, to know more over the coming weeks. Thank you. Next question, please. We have a follow-up, Michael Perchick, WTVD. Uh, thank you for both of your answers. Uh, this question is for either of you. Um, there was a press conference last week 
uh, with bipartisan state leaders uh, encouraging local dis school districts uh, to allow a return to the classroom. And one of the studies cited was the ABC collaborative study, uh, which involved researchers at Duke and UNC looking at 11 school districts here in North Carolina at the beginning of the school year. Now, that study was on a hybrid system. However, there are some school districts that are not returning to a hybrid system, but are returning to a full in-class uh, routine. Are there any concerns that the data cited encouraging school districts to return is not necessarily aligning with the decisions the school districts are taking? First, we want children back in the classroom and in person. That's important. However, it needs to be done under the right health protocols. And I'm going to let Dr. Cohen discuss the specifics of that. Hi, Michael. So just to reiterate what the difference in the safety protocols are, no matter what school, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school, everyone has to be wearing masks all the time. They have to do things like screening for temperature. They have to be cleaning uh, surfaces often. The difference between a plan A that we are allowing for any elementary school at this point and plan B is really about how much social distancing do you have at all times when students are stationary. And for elementary school, because of the different nature of the way this virus spreads in younger children, we are allowing folks to go back without maintaining that six feet and to do things as, as small as three feet. We want to maintain that six feet of distance in our middle and high school, given the data that we have seen about how this virus spreads. In our middle and high school age students, it spreads closer to what it was like in adults. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we were both, we're doing the masks, we're doing the cleaning, and we are maintaining six feet of distance in our middle and high schools. That being said, six feet of distance does not require a district to necessarily be hybrid. It does require them to have that six feet of distance, but depending on the physical layout of the individual classrooms, the schools, the number of students who choose and opt for virtual, that might not be hybrid for a middle school or high school to maintain that six feet of different, uh, distance. So uh, I wouldn't say it's just a hybrid, not hybrid distinction here. For us, it is really about that six feet of distance in middle school and high school that is important as we think about those safety protocols. We want to see those followed. However, again, six feet does not necessarily mean hybrid hybrid necessarily. We want to see that six feet of distance and that could happen in a number of ways and how they use their physical buildings and how many students are in a classroom. Thank you. Good explanation, Dr. Cohen. Uh, next question, please. Our next question is from Brian Anderson with the Associated Press. Hi, Governor. Hi, Dr. Cohen. Brian Anderson here with EAP. Thanks for the time. Uh, I had a, a general question for, for Dr. Cohen sort of into the weeds a little bit. We're hearing reports of people from Virginia coming in along the coast uh, to get vaccinated in North Carolina. And it appears on the state dashboard that around 3% of the data is missing for county of residents. Is that because people aren't, aren't disclosing it or is that because they're not state residents? So I was just hoping if, if you had any numbers or anything to share on, on that. Uh, and secondly, can these counties say it is not allowable for outside residents to come in? Can we pre give preference to NC residents? So forgive me, I threw a lot out there, but I was just curious yep. about the, the state of things. So Brian, let me do your first question on the data, and I have to go back and, and understand whether that was truly missing data or if that is our way of representing that, that those folks do not live in the state of North Carolina. So let us follow back up with you on the data question. Overall, what we have been saying, right, this is a federal asset um, that when we are agreeing to take this from the federal government, that we are, our jurisdiction is not meant to uh, keep anyone from getting the vaccine. 
Um, so CDC has very recently clarified, as recently as this morning, clarifying that guidance. And so our team is digging into that to understand. It does not say that you can limit across county lines, but they are um, making a distinction for now across state lines. So stay tuned as we try to understand this new CDC guidance again that just came as of this morning. Um, but up until this point, the CDC guidance had been you cannot limit by jurisdiction. What we have said, though, is why you can't limit there are ways that you can both market and open appointments and use your operational capability to make sure you are prioritizing those in your county or in the state of North Carolina. Similar to the kinds of, of mechanisms we are using to make sure we are reaching our underserved communities, our African American, Hispanic, Latinx community, where we partner differently, where we open appointments differently. I think those are the ways in which we can both market and operationalize, making sure that we're prioritizing vaccine for those in North Carolina or for a particular county that is, you know, particularly our smaller counties that um, that are getting just a limited number of doses. And again, you know, we are all trying to work through this together. So we'll analyze this new uh, rec this new guidance from the CDC and figure out how that translates into what we need to do here in North Carolina. Thanks. Next question, please. Our final question today is from Vanessa Rufus with WCNC. Hi, thank you for taking my question. I wanted to know, since it sounds like you're close to giving us some firmer uh, timelines for moving into group three. Do you have an approximate for how, how much of group one and how much of group two that you've gotten through with vaccinations? I'll let Dr. Cohen address that. Hi, Vanessa. So as you know, we are vaccinating those who are 65 and up, as well as our health care workers. 65 and up is a, is a group that we, we better understand the numbers Healthcare workers, again, that, that's a group that, can, that, that we don't have the greatest numbers on in terms of, of penetration, but it looks like we are about 50% into our 65 and older uh, group of folks. So we are making a lot of progress, but that still means, as the governor keeps saying, we know that there are thousands of those who are 65 and up who are waiting for a vaccine. We want to make sure we are prioritizing those who are 65 and up again, because that tracks with our data of who is at the highest risk of death here in North Carolina. So we're going to keep um, making sure we're working at, at those who are 65 and up, getting them vaccines um, and getting out, particularly as we've been talking about today, both in a speedy and equitable way across the state. And you have a follow-up, I think? Yes, I had a follow-up. Um, so I'm sure there are going to be a lot of factors that go into deciding at what point to move on to group three, but what would you be looking at? For example, would you be looking at refusal rates within the current, you know, active group? Are you trying to hit a certain percentage threshold before you move on? What are you thinking about right now? There are a lot of factors to look at, but I know that they have been, the vaccine team has been fixated on trying to make sure we can get as many people 65 and over vaccinated because of the high death rate. We have a lot of essential workers that are very important and right now the team is working through that process to determine when, what dates that uh, we can make decisions to move into essential workers and how we do that. Would you want to add to that? Hi, Vanessa. As we've shared before, we are continually talking to our vaccine providers and really trying to understand what are they experiencing on the ground and are they seeing a slowing down of demand and are they ready to move on to uh, the, the next group of, of folks? And what we have heard is that largely folks are still vaccinating their, those that are 65 and up. Each week we get a few more providers to say, you know what, I, I think we're, we're ready to, to move on to the group, which is why we're trying to analyze that as well as project out into the future so that we can give our vaccine providers as well as our frontline essential workers that time to prepare. So it's that balancing act of both wanting to understand what's happening on the ground with the numbers and project forward so that we can give folks time to operationalize, which is why the governor is saying this week is when we'd like to give some folks a little more certainty on that timeline so we have, have the ability to to plan uh, going forward. Thank you. 
Thank you all for being with us today. Please stay safe out there.